tales for dark nights. Knuckle Supper Written by Drew Stepick Performed here by Jason Hill Chapter 13 Angels Wrapped in a blanket and on a bath mat, Bates snored in Tahoe's arms. I rang the doorbell. Are you sure you want to do this, RJ? Tahoe whispered, trying not to wake Bait. Before I got the chance to respond, Pico chimed in. It's the right thing to do, ho. Rather than challenging the plan, the big man nodded his head. Sure, he'd rather been out hunting, lifting weights or whatever he did in his spare time, but I think I did a concrete job convincing them both that we all had a certain obligation. It was something beyond the self-serving addiction that kept us alive. One of the Batwangers answered the Christmas light covered steel door. Leave it to the Batwangers to be seasonably festive. I extended my hand to shake. I'm here to see Nomi. He ignored my gesture and invited us inside. Decorated top to bottom like an oddball 60s science fiction movie circa Barbarella, the Wanger's lair, or brothel, was action-packed with characters for the set. We were escorted toward Nomi's Queen's Den, filling the hallways with a strange reverberation of operatic new wave and techno music. It sounded more like whale mating sampled over the break beats than cohesive music. Pulsating buttons and control panels lined the walls. As we passed rooms, batwangers came out in silver and gold stretched cat suits, winking and making passing comments at Tahoe. Did you bring room service, big man? One of them asked. Tahoe responded, She's not food, referring to the sleeping bait. Tuck it back in your pants. I commended him by slapping him on the ass. Good job, Tahoe. That's what you say until you hear otherwise. As the halls warped and webbed toward the end, Nomi's door slid open like an airlock on a spaceship. Darker than the rest of the house, the room sat as the centralized decorative parasite, seemingly infecting everything else it touched. Cables dripping with green ooze and neon and plastic encased wiring sprouted out into the halls like the limbs of alien creatures. Knowing of Nomi's multiple connections in the Hollywood world, I would have been surprised if his portion of the house was designed by a special effects artist who happened to go missing when the interior design was complete. Our greeter stopped at the door and gracefully ushered us in. Please, have a seat. Nomi is expecting you. He then pointed us to a fabricated Martian tentacle that crossed the room and beveled near our end of Nomi's centerpiece, his bed. The four of us did as we were instructed and sat down. Nomi's bed was truly something to behold. Obviously playing off the giant foreign insect theme while keeping the whole H.R. Giger decor intact, the bed was an enormous canopy. Spinning around the black support poles were more living cables that were using hydraulics to create a breathing effect. It didn't look like anything was bought from Home Depot. The canopy top was more of a web that pulsated inward and outward and wove itself in a circular pattern as if it were powered by a motor. It was the most unique piece in the room because, although I was sure it wasn't a projection, I had no earthly idea how it was spinning itself from nothing to a fully woven web and then back to nothing. I think Tahoe was trying to peek behind the bed to get the upper hand on any giant train tarantulas that were planning a surprise attack. Even though I thought it was indeed unique and cool, it just seemed like more of the eldritch and king cobra pyrotechnics and theatrics than anything else. But in Nomi's defense, he was a very high-priced transgender prostitute, and I always gave his grandiose stagecraft a free pass. Eldritch and Cobra, on the other hand, had no excuse beyond being failed performers. Bait woke up and rubbed her eyes. What the hell is this? She tightened into Tahoe's cradle. Are we dead, RJ? No, you're not dead. Nomi appeared from a second room off to the side of the bed. Judging from his elaborate outfit, I guessed he was appearing magically from the wardrobe where he was going to make changes between performances. In reality, it was a walk-in closet he was hiding in so he could make an extravagant entrance after he knew we had a minute to take in the mothership. 
This is cool, Bates said, trying desperately to glance at every piece in the room. Nomi walked over to Bait and Tahoe and ran his fingers through Bates' greasy, blood-encrusted hair. He wore a leather, form-fitted battle suit that left none of his curves to the imagination, including his boobs and cock. The futuristic witch garb was accentuated with an enormous collar that reflected the interwoven webbing on top of the bed and ended in a lengthy train of steel worms. He wore spiked gloves and buckled moon boots that lit up with bright red lights on the soles. His eyelashes were also spiked, and they popped out from the light blue makeup covering his face. In the center of the makeup, one sparkling silver stripe crossed the tip of his nose at an angle from the bottom of one ear to the fake pointed tip of the other. His lipstick was the same shade as the stripe, though it was difficult to judge the palette due to the chappy after-effects of collagen abuse. Light, he called out. Our greeter scampered over and lit a bright red cigarette that was extended six inches by a holder. Leave us, Nomi instructed the concierge, who bowed to each of us, then backed out of the room through a secret entrance. His mirrored platform shoes clunked across the disco throbbing floor. Nomi's hands moved to Bates' breasts. He cupped them. He cupped them, shook off his hands almost immediately, and then proceeded to measure Bates' arm tone using a skinfold caliper around her bicep. Pico looked at me puzzled and wriggled his shoulders. What? He mouthed. I ignored him. I suppose I should have told him in Tahoe how I arranged the meeting. Okay, biggins, Nomi sent to Tahoe. Now let's see his rocket. Tahoe looked at Bate and looked back at him. Come on, big boy. Let's see the dick. As Nomi reached over to unwrap the blanket, Bate swatted at his twirling neon fingernails. I ain't got no dick, Bate yelled. Nomi spiraled around to address me. RJ. Before he reached my line of view, his leather and steel train got stuck in one of the canopy poles. He immediately tongued it free, almost causing him to lose his balance. RJ. What is this? This little boy won't do, Bate yelled again. I ain't got a dick because I... <laughs> Taking a cue from me, Tahoe covered her mouth. Pico started to look around the room for an escape route. He fixated on the hidden wall that the helper exited from. Too bad for all of us, we were already trapped in my perpetual laundry list of lies. Nomi hovered backward then took a seat on the bed. He sat as gently as he walked. Does anyone want to tell me what the fuck is going on here? Pico, Bate, and Tahoe looked to me for answers. Bate waved at me. She was still in pain and completely jacked up on drugs. Nomi snapped his fingers. Anyone answer? Besides R.J. Reynolds. He stood up and began pacing in front of us like a schoolhouse principal that was disciplining a gang of unruly hooligans. He pressed a button on the glove of his left hand that flicked out a Swiss Army cyborg-like ashtray. Impressed, Pico nodded his head. After ashing his smoke, Nomi continued, How is it that R.J. Reynolds called me a few hours ago and told me that he found a new member for my... He stopped and took a drag from the long fire stick. Group. He started pacing again. How is it that you three idiots walked into my house with a human teenager? Not just any human teenager, mind you. A female human teenager. Bate managed to inch out through a gap in Tahoe's fingers. Oh yeah, you're one of them dick eaters. Ignoring the ridiculous child, Nomi stopped directly in front of me and puffed away. Correct her, he advised. I cleared my throat. It might have been a laughable situation if we weren't sitting in the dead center of twenty bloodthirsty she-males. <clears throat> um, Bate, it's, uh... It's Batwangers. Nomi shuffled back to me. Since they won't talk, this brings me back to you, R.J. Reynolds. I tickled my chin with the back of my hand. Um, funny thing, Nomi. He bent down and touched noses with me. His eyelashes batted mine. Before I had a chance to stand up, he spit his cigarette across the room and planted his strong hands on my knees. As the ashtray retracted into its home within the wrist of his glove... Two sharp spikes popped out of his thumbs. He leaned forward with his hands and the blades edged my penis. His hot breath let out his last drag. 
What thing? His low, smooth voice belted my ears and made me wonder, who could ever think this was a woman? The funny thing is that I lied, I confessed. I need your help. He fluttered his eyelashes again, dragging them down my cheeks. Bate, who I could always count on to say the wrong thing at the wrong time, sang out, I'm not a boy! The steel thumbnails inched closer to my stick, ready to shish kebab it at any second. Shut up, Miss Thing. Nomi lashed back, unfazed by Bates' babbling. He stared into my eyes, looking for another lie. Why do you need my help, RJ? I had to lie, Nomi. I put my hands up to surrender. Let me get something out of my bag. He stalled for a minute and then retracted the spikes. The sweat from my brow mixed with his mascara and slid down my face onto my neck. He stood up and instructed me to do the same. Keeping my hands visible at all times to prove I had nothing up my sleeve, I pulled my backpack off my shoulders and then dropped it to my feet. Proceed? Nomi allowed. I bent down and unzipped the bag. Nomi extended his long neck over to try and catch a glimpse of the contents. There better not be a gun in there or my bitches will be in here... No gun. Or weapon, I assure you. I reached down into the bag. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Tahoe and Pico also trying to get a bird's eye view of the mystery the backpack contained. I pulled it out and lofted it to Nomi. He flinched and the bag landed on the bed next to him. He pressed it to his nose and sniffed it. Heroin? I rested my elbow on my knee and felt around my crotch to make sure everything was still intact. Yeah, (laughs) That's a pound of the cleanest shit I've ever come across. First, Nomi judged the weight by balancing the bag between both of his hands. Then, he sliced open the corner for a little taste of the pony. He swished it around in his mouth like he was in wine country and then swallowed. It's good, he concluded. What do I want with this? It's a pound of heroin. With it. I give you and the rest of your crew free reign to distribute anywhere you want in knuckle or territory. You've always wanted in on the action. What? Tahoe and Pico yelled in unison. RJ, what the hell are you doing? Tahoe added. I put my hand up to silence their concerns. Nomi's face showed signs of warming. A barely visible smirk could almost be seen behind the bloated lips. Hmm. And... What do I have to do for you to be honored with such a privilege? I sensed cynicism in his voice, but I needed his help. Besides, the Batwangers could eat the four of us alive. I played to his female side, pointing to bait. This little girl was raped, and she gave herself an abortion with a soda bottle. She's 13 years old, and I'm concerned that she'll get killed if she stays with me any longer. Bait waved at Nomi. Nomi walked back over to Bait. As if that weren't obvious when you walked in here. This must be that hooker you brought to King Cobra on Halloween? The one you begged and pleaded for with him? How humane of you, RJ. Nomi put his hands around Bate's head and cupped her ears. Then he moved down to her thighs like he had with me. He didn't bother with the blades. Go on. I cleared my throat. A snot rocket was whistling up and down inside my face. Just please let them... Them? Yeah. Pico, Tahoe, and the girl. Please let them stay here, out of sight until I can get this nightmare sorted out. Nomi patted Bait on the hips and got back up. I need to make sure we're all on the same page here, RJ. You want me to take this fruity old man, the roided out retard, and this 13 year old hooker, human hooker, And in return, I get to deal the heroin that you stole from King Cobra and have been hiding with Eldritch and dealing not very secretly in Culver City. A jittery feeling of surprise slammed through my neck and titillated my armpits. Rather than respond to the reading of my death certificate, I remained fossilized with my elbow on my knee. Come on, RJ, don't be so shocked. You didn't think I knew all of that. Nomi put his hands up like puppets and made them talk to each other. How could I possibly know that? One hand said. I don't know. 
Aren't you just some stupid faggot bitch? The other hand responded. He slapped them together, making boom sounds with his mouth. Isn't that right? Isn't that what you knuckle fuckers have called me for years? More ashamed at that moment than surprised that our extra stealth operation had been exposed, I simply admitted to him. Yes. You. He dragged his finger down the line, starting with me, to Pico, and finally to Tahoe. You all think you're doing us a favor by letting us live and hunt in your precious territory. You are the most evil and hurtful of all of us. You simply don't care at all. When you need something, though, you come crying to us with stories of the inhumanity you suffer beside us. Well, guess what, bitches? I'm a vampire, too. I don't want it. He threw the heroin back to me. I will let them hide here, and I won't turn the little whore out. Me! Bait waved again, smiling. I don't want your pity drugs, RJ. No, me. Please let me pay you back somehow. He surged back into my face. What's the matter? Does the big badass RJ Reynolds have feelings? He shoved me on the shoulders. Don't act like you care. If it's not the knucklers who wipe us out, it will be BBP. If it's not those dandies, it will be the battle snakes. It doesn't mean anything. Besides, you already paid for this favor. How so? Pico asked. Nomi rolled around with the bedpost until he landed flat out on the bed. The metal tails followed him, slithering around the room. Are you really that dumb old man? I stood up. I'm not following either. Nomi pulled a stainless steel compact from his pocket and tugged out a nose hair. You don't really think I'm the only one who knows about your mystery powder, do you? I looked at him confused. Oh, come on, RJ. I thought you were a little smarter than that. Surely you must have had some inkling in your bloated belly that King Cobra knew about all this. I swallowed the snot rocket. Fear unlocked it from my nasal passage. Actually, no. The way I look at it, your territory becomes our territory pretty soon. Those drugs will make their pretty little way into my house soon enough. Good evening. This is Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill podcast. You've been listening to a chapter from the award-winning novel Knuckle Supper by best-selling author Drew Stebeck. Knuckle Supper, Ultimate Gutter Fix Edition, and its critically acclaimed sequel, Knuckle Bald, are available now from Bloodbound Books. Check out the links in the video description and sticky comments below to pick up a copy today and show your support for indie horror. Also, please consider making a donation to Children of the Night today and help end teen prostitution and human trafficking. Children of the Night is a privately funded nonprofit organization established in 1979 with the specific purpose of providing intervention in the lives of children who are sexually exploited and vulnerable to, or involved in, prostitution and pornography. Visit childrenofthenight.org for more information today. From author Drew Stepick and all of us here at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, thanks for listening and for your support. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.